Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you could head over to patreon.com slash Aksum. You can join the YouTube channel directly or even better, subscribe to the substack, aksum.substack.com. I think they're a little less censorious than YouTube. Welcome again to the program, Diakon Tariku. Hello, Hue. Thank you again uh, for inviting me back. I can't believe it's been a couple of years since uh, last time we spoke here. Right? Yeah, the podcast itself is a couple of years old. It was, I think, June 2020 when uh, I started. I don't remember when exactly our last episode was, but we'll try to link to it in the description on YouTube so folks can catch it. I remember that time we were focused on the American setting and what some of the bishops had to say in that context but lately it's hard not to have our hearts back home i remember growing up i used to hear from some of the elders um, the only thing they cared about in american politics was what was the position of the usfg towards ethiopia and i always stuck with me it wasn't quite me i i was interested in the domestic and the foreign but the past two or three years or so especially let's say since the uh uh the law enforcement operation slash civil war started. <laughs> uh, I think Ethiopia has been on a lot of our minds, but I want to rewind a bit. And I've, I've discussed this subject with other people, but I think it's always good to get fresh voices on and different perspectives, particularly with people who lived through it. You know, I was born and raised in the US, so I have a greater distance from these things, although I have a, a lot of direct people in my family who have that. So I have secondhand experience. So I just want to hear what was it like where you grew up in Ethiopia? You know, I was a baby, you were slightly older when uh, Ehadeg actually came to power. So you had a little bit, I imagine, of memories of the Derk, uh, maybe not a ton, but a little bit before, and then the transition to uh, Ehadeg, which is basically, you know, the, the TPLF regime. So could you talk about your your earliest memories of the government of Ethiopia and what, if anything, kind of uh, change like the did, were people hopeful at all during that change and and how long you know did it take for that glimmering gate of hope to glimmer away uh, fade away yeah it's, it's kind of sort of like um what is happening right now uh, if you remember two years ago uh you know when abi came to power and the whole change started it was kind of a euphoric moment uh, where pe we're all thinking like everything is going to be peaceful, peaceful transition of power, and things going to change. Uh, little we know that you know all this atrocities in war uh, happened in the last couple of years. So my memory when uh, TPLF or Ihadek then uh, passed through Gondar. Uh, that's that's where I was born as a child. Um, did you well, actually see them? Oh yeah, yeah. You physically I, saw them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually have uh, a very a traumatic experience when they uh, pass uh, across the city that I I grew up in, and that is I always I don't I don't tell this story a lot, but uh, so when he had it past the city, it's a little town. Uh, there was. Um, uh, Ihapa. I don't know if you ever heard of this political party back then. Uh, they used to be like the junior uh, rebels next to TPLF, aka uh, Ihadek. And so, first TPLF was, was just going across towns uh, to add this. That was their main mission. And so, uh, they were not leaving administration or anything like that. And so. There's no administration. They, you know, the Doug is gone. TPLF is gone. You know, passing through at this. So um, Ehapa was coming in, and so once they got to uh, at this, they were coming back and kind of restructuring the government, uh, uh, making their presence known. And so when they came back, I remember I was playing with one of my friends uh, in the field right next to Lake Dana. Um, Ihapa was there, the soldiers were there, 
And when TPLF came back, they found out that IHAPA was there. And so we were in the middle of the war. And I remember uh, me and uh, one of my friends, we just hugged each other and to the ground and bullet passing by through our, you know, over us. And it's a, it was a very traumatic moment. And I really thought that uh, that was, that was going to be it. So everything, you know, quiet down when we got up, it was, you know, all dead bodies and whatnot. But that was a very traumatic moment that I had. And so in general, you know, people thought that, you know, the Dirk is going. Um, uh, another- was your, Were your family and friends sad about that? Oh yeah, that the Dirk is gone? Yeah. No, no, if you remember Malaku Tafarra, I don't know if you ever heard of The that. Butcher of Gondar, yes. He tried yes, to uh, publicly execute my grandfather, who was a short time governor of Bagemder. And he tried to do that in Devra Marcos in Gwajam. And actually his uh, his memoir on the subject is one of my many projects, which I failed to translate right here with Awud Adiba Zabbat Hiwat. His memoir is about uh, Shialaka Malaku, the butcher of Gwander, uh, doing that, as well as a general kind of history of, he grew up in Dabat, so a little yeah. northeast of the city, a little bit farther from where, where you uh, grew up near Tana. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so you know about Malaku Tafur, and so uh, the people were so happy, uh, be it TPLF, be it MPLF, whatever it may be, the Dirk is gone was, you know, that was their primary objective is the Dirk is gone. And so everybody was happy. I remember as a kid, I was in elementary school, and we go to school and we say, did you do your homework? You know, and we go say, Al-Saram, uh, Al-Sarrahu. And the teacher will say, Lemon, why? And we go, Democracy, Mabteno. Because we thought that, you know, democracy was a thing. It was a word back then. You know, there's going to be democracy in Ethiopia. So as a child, that's what we heard. So Democracy, Mabteno. And I'm not going to do my homework. Uh, that goes to show you the uh, sentiment at a time uh, uh, that the people, that the population had. But, you know, as we all know, things turn for the worst under TPLF. How, how long was that moment <clears throat> of euphoria? Like, you know, I don't know how deep you were in, in your schooling by that time, but like, I don't know, from like silly things, like, did you have like a Derek anthem that you used to say in school and then did it switch to like a TPLF, a new anthem? Like, do you remember any of that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, my fondest memory was uh, the three, uh, there used to be this uh, uh, picture of the three, the Navy, the Air Force, and uh, Navy, Air Force, and Army, I think, of the Russian, the Communist uh, Party. And, uh, who, who, what was their name, the communist people at the time? The three people that are known in the communist uh, regime. I don't know, Lenin, Stalin. Lenin, yeah, yep, yeah. Stalin, all of those <laughs> I ones. Know. I don't know who else. Yep, yep, and there was a third one. And so um, we used to have those and we used to sing uh, uh, communist theme, uh, Mesmur. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it all changed right away. Um, and it kind of, my memory kind of, my memory kind of fed, fed away, but uh, it did change right away. Yeah, yeah. What so? You know, I'm. You're saying everyone's hopeful about democracy and everything in the beginning. Do you have any sort of recollection as to when you started to hear kind of very bad things? For me, I can tell you, I visited Ethiopia often from about 1993 to 2011, and the big kind of crescendo moments for me, because I was a kid in the 90s, was the war with Eritrea over the border, 98 to 2000. I, I remember specifically watching that on ETV when I was there over the summer, and I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And then a, I think a few years later, I don't know if it's 04, I think it was 05, when the political opposition had like 200 people shot in the public square, and they got rid of texting, but was it that late for you or was it sometime in the 90s that you had some sort of political awakening or conscience? 
Um, so I, I came to the States in mid nineties, I think it's 90, 96, 95, 96. Okay. Before the war, before the war, before the 97 election, um, uh, and all of that. So I, I really never had any political awakening at the time, even, even moving back here. Uh, I do remember the, the war with Eritrea I mean, I do remember about the 97 election, but other than that, I was never deep into the political affairs of Ethiopia. When when would you say what, what was the the moment for you that you began to to notice something was off? That's interesting. I think I shared this uh, story with you uh, going back to Ethiopia in 2004. No, it was 2008, where we have relatives from Walkite uh, region area. And um, to see them being afraid of speaking Amarinya. And, you know, I start to ask, like, you know, what is it? I didn't even know, like, the whole Wolkite story, you know. Yeah. <laughs> used to be in Rwanda, now it's in Tigray. I, I, don't, I, never, I never had any knowledge of all of that. And so I start to dig about that. And then I start to become aware of the atrocities of TPLF, especially in that region. Um, and then, of course, in Ethiopia, uh, the 97 election. So uh, I start to read more, and that's that's when I start to become active in political affairs of Ethiopia. And so uh, if you remember, I started talking about TPLF before, I, I'm not even sure even you know a lot about TPLF before it became famous thing, you know, a trend in uh, social media these days. Yeah, I, I I know you were an early critic of them. I mean, I like I knew people uh, talking about it for a long time. You know, the Walkait issue is a particular issue of my grandfather. He he wrote a letter to Medlis in November of ninety one that I translated recently for people to read. So that's that's pretty early. November ninety one is pretty early. I was, uh, you know, at I that time I was a baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was a baby at that time. So I was, you know, I was not conscious of that stuff, but I always kind of heard people talking about it, but I never understood the language part of it until I was older because my parents didn't raise me talking about like different ethnic groups within Ethiopia. You know, I, I understood that my parents were from Addis Ababa, the capital city, and they were Ethiopian. Beyond that, you know, my mom liked to talk about Gondar a lot, but my dad never talked about anything ethnic and uh, even my mom wouldn't talk a lot about that stuff you know so they're they're really uh from the capital city from that culture where it was seen as taboo to talk about those things so i had to explore those things on my own after reading up on politics and talking to distant family members and close family members and friends and i had to learn about what my own ethnic background was by asking questions about my about who where my what my parents background was so i had to piece i had to piecemeal it together it wasn't something that was ever directly told to me by my parents mm -hmm. which is it's kind of funny even to this day that like never use that that language which is you know it's certainly had a, a profound impact on me but i i remember yeah you had no love lost for tplf and uh, another particular uh, organization we could save for another day <laughs> but i'm yeah. from a long time i probably as soon as i met you i remember you were going hard on those issues and it just i think a lot of people lost hope but also there was a sense of of terror i remember asking people like my friends in 2011 in 2008 and 2007 and those are three most recent times i went to ethiopia and they would tell me like even at a cafe hushed voices they wouldn't feel comfortable because they felt like some spies were listening to them or something uh, or you don't know who is gonna turn you in and so i i just got the vibe of uh uh of a police state you know but i, I just from my reaction of the young friends who most of them didn't want to openly discuss politics at all when I was in Ethiopia. And then people here seem to be generally in the groups I moved around opposition. But as I got older, I met people who are kind of more pro government Ethiopia. And it was interesting, you know, the only ever kind of credit you can give them is maybe uh, partial credit for the dam, which is uh, now getting uh, filled, thank God. But uh, even then, there are some question marks about where all the money went. So, 
you went more recently than 2008. When was the last time you visited? It was sometime during the war, the current war, I imagine, the civil war. Yeah, it's、um, two, yeah, a year ago. A year ago. A year ago. September of、uh, 2021.、Yeah. And where all did you go? So,、um, so I was in Addis.、Uh, that's where my wife's.、Um, Family and her parents lived there, and she's from there. And、uh, we had a chance to visit、uh, Gurage Agar. I don't know if you've ever been to that part of the country. I haven't. Well, I, I may have been around there, but not directly, no. Yeah, so I was in Muscat, and things kind of、uh, aligned themselves because、uh, Hoya Antana was there,、uh, Nuna was there, his wife. And so We were able to meet them and、uh, celebrate Mescal there in Gurage,、uh, in this little town called Gunchiri.、Uh, it's about、uh, an hour and a half, maybe two hours from Addis.、Mm-hmm. Actually, it's a little farther than that. I might have forgot how far it might be. But it was such a beautiful culture that they have there. The, the way they celebrate Mescal,、uh, I re- strongly recommend、uh, for people to experience that. That part of our culture. Yeah, you had all the false banana bread, the kocho, the wusa, and the,、uh, the kudfo and the kurt as well, the raw meat、yeah. and the rare meat. And the kebe. Yeah, the gomen,、so, yeah, yeah, gomen kudfo has kebe in it, right? The collard greens with butter. Everything has kebe. So there,、yeah. there's, there's a saying in Gurage、uh, area they say the only thing Gurages don't eat without kebe is the air they breathe. <laughs> I mean, they literally. Use kebe quite a lot, and I love it. I love kebe、uh, naturally, so it was for me, it was home. Yeah, I'm looking up where the zone is, so it's it's、uh, towards the road towards Jimma. So I don't think I've ever been there. I've been on the road to Shasha Mane and Dawasa and all that, so、mm-hmm. I think I kind of、uh, passed it by adjacently, but you have to go off the road to get there, so I don't think I've ever been there. You do.、Um, it was not a pretty drive, the drive was pretty. Um, not good, but uh, it was, it was worth it. Uh, and that's、up. not a war zone at all, right? There's there's no. no sort of I haven't heard of the closest fighting to that I could think of is in the opposite direction and like northeast of Addis Ababa. That I know some of the TPLF troops made it to Debrecina, but there's nothing in that in the Gurage area, right? No, it's very peaceful, it has been peaceful. Uh, throughout all this difficult time in Ethiopia. So it was, it was very peaceful, relatively speaking. So we celebrated Mescal there.、Uh, it was quite an experience. I really, really, like I said, I, I recommend people to ex- experience that part of our culture. Yeah. And for and, an aside for our Orthodox Christian friends who don't know, Amarinya Mescal is the exaltation of the cross. It's actually a holiday celebrated all over the world. but In Ethiopia, it's a little different, and in the Gurage zone, it's extra special. Very, very extra special.、Um, and also,、uh, His Grace Abu Namal k a z e d e k his reburial、uh, in Addis, the Selassie Cathedral. And that was one of、uh, the highlights of my trip. trip.、Uh, Lik Ant from all over Gondor was, were there. I don't know if you、uh, were able to watch the live transmission. It was a phenomenal, it was, it was a beautiful、um, moment that I had at Kadis Selassie and the statue,、uh, how it was built there、uh, for him, right in front of Kadis Selassie, which is, which is fitting for him. As you know, he is,、um, he administered that church during Kaila Selassie era. Yeah,、like、for、that. a long time. I know a lot of priests and deacons who served underneath him, i- including.、Uh, Two of our past patriarchs, the、oh, current、yeah. one, Abu n a m a t i a s and、uh, Abu n a m a r k o r i o s as well, who recently fell asleep with the Lord. Yeah.、Uh, may their prayer be with、uh, all of us.、Uh, but、Amen. it was, it was, it was a good, a good、uh, beautiful moment there. And then we went to Gondar.、Uh, that, was, that was not an easy decision for us to go then.、Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was not peaceful at the time. Uh, the war was it was full fledged war when we went there.、Uh, but we had to go. 
uh, I had to introduce, you know, my wives. We, we, we got married in August and we went right away. So we had to make the time uh, to meet the family. Uh, we went there uh, and surprisingly, you know, there was at the city of Gondar with all this chaos happening uh, a few miles away from the city, the city was relatively okay. There was a curfew, uh, 8 p.m. But uh, other than that, it was it was very peaceful. So uh, we spent a couple of weeks there and a week in Bahardar. Uh, we were able to visit um, people who are who lost, you know, their loved ones from up north in the Tigray region area. Uh, a lot of displaced people, elderly and children. Uh, there was a camp in, in Bahardar, so we were able to visit uh, the site. It was not a pretty site, but uh, we're fortunate, you know, to be there, uh, to see the community there. And um, yeah, and uh, we came back to Addis. Uh, um, so you, you stayed in South, like kind of South Gondar near uh, the Tsana or Tana uh, Lake. And then also you went to the city of Gondar. Did you go at all towards like the Tekaze River or like that's too much of the war zone? Like, but you're saying like the city itself was uh, a little on edge? The city, uh, I was, in a, I grew up in a little town. Uh, you might have heard of this Gorgora project. Yes. So this little town called Delgi, uh, support city. Uh, that's where I grew up. But now my, my, my parents, they all live in Addis. I mean, in Gondar. In the city oh, in Gondar. the city. Okay. So that's that's where I was. And uh, yeah, so I, I I had a plan to go to Takaze, uh, to swim in Takaze, actually. That was yeah. my plan. Because I saw some pictures on social media and I thought it was it would be pretty cool to to see yeah. it uh, in person and to see him in the water. Um, I don't know if you know Muluno Johannes from Seattle. He he yeah. did that. He drove from from Humara to Takaze, and he he was saying on Adabawai Media that he he swam in the Takaze. For him, it was a little bit of a spiritual moment. <laughs> it is. It is for for those who are you know aware of the whole situation. Swimming in that river is it is uh, it's a moment to have, but uh, I was I was not able to do so because the security situation was it was pretty awful. Mm -hmm. So outside of Gondor, that is outside of the city. Yeah, but uh, I I spent most of my time all my time in the city Gondor. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, and man, um, did you <laughs> run into? and see any of the soldiers that would remind you of that transition period? Because this is kind of, like you mentioned, it's a transition period of its own, right? There are a lot of unknowns and that's some of what I want to talk to you about. But did you see any soldiers running around or just civilians armed? I'm sure you saw, I saw myself videos and pictures of people like celebrating Timkat, which is a different time, right? The epiphany and people are dancing with their, their guns. And that was a few months after your visit. Yeah, yeah, I was there for Tamkats as well uh, in in Addis, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Grage, no, yeah, I was there for Tamkat. Yeah, is it Tamkat or Muscat? I think I might have been there for Muscat, not for Tamkat. But um, yeah, I mean everybody's armed in Gondar. Uh, <laughs> everybody's army and ready because. Uh, at a time, uh, TPLF was advancing. Their goal was to control Gondar mm -hmm. and to advance to Walkait and Tagare through Gondar. Interesting. Because, yeah, because they know that that is going to be that's where they're going to face most of their resistance. If they exert most of their power in Gondar, then it would be easy walk to um, Walkait, and in Addis would be easy. But so that was their original plan. They were close to uh, Bahardar uh not soon before i went there so everybody was in their age and everybody was armed um uh there were a, a lot of military uh, officers in gondar the goa hotel uh matter of fact when i got to gondar abi was there a day after a day before i got there and so there was this military helicopter 
when we arrived in Aze Theodore's uh, airport. So we were trying to take a picture of the military helicopter and they say, no, no, you know, you can't take a picture, you know how they are. Yeah. They don't pay you to take a picture of military. Um, um, don't want to reveal secrets during a limited right. war. Right. So when we asked, they told They'll us. They'll consider that, you like a Assange. Yes. Yes. So they told us that Abi was there and uh, he was meeting the local militia commanders uh, in how to you know get get them out of uh, that region and they were they were able to successfully to did that um soon after we left going there you know this is kind of an aside but my mother grew up and she would tell me that she liked country music and i used to always look at her crazy because i was a fan of hip-hop but the more and the older i get and the more i think about it there seems to be some sort of general theme of patriotism which is tied there. And as a guy who's also spent a significant amount of his life in the South, I, I wonder if you could speak on anything like, you know, I see political figures like Killer Mike, who's, you know, big in, in the city of Atlanta and TI for that matter, mm -hmm. who are, you know, they could be even as, as Democrat as you want them to be, but they're still super into to guns. You know, maybe the closest thing like that on the left historically was the, the Black Panther Party. But I wonder if you could, say anything in terms of comparing the gun culture of uh, Georgia to the gun culture of Gondar? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it was not my choice uh, growing up in Atlanta in the South. It just happens to be uh, my brother uh, was here, my family are here, uh, live here. So it is kind of similar um, in Gondar, Azmarivet, uh, the, the kings back, back in the day, uh to that was their way of uh, gauging what the people think what the society think of them so to know that they don't do surveys at a time as you know so what they do is they send uh people in asmari bait asmari bait is um how do, how do you translate asmari bait uh well it's like a, it's kind of like a dance hall but you know it's like a traditional instrument playing guy who comes up with poetry i always considered it secular kinney i feel like uh with all due respect they're the kinney dropouts they go into the secular or maybe the ones who just want money more than the glory of god but it's uh coming up with creative poetry about like love and dance and uh you know yes. like country the country it could be about the king sometimes sometimes they're the only people who are allowed uh, the kind of coverage to be able to make fun of the king, but also using all this indirect language in Amharic, like not in a very direct way. Right. So they they sent uh, their people in Azmari Bay to gauge what the public sentiment is about them. And so uh, even now, uh, going to Azmari Bay in Gondar, you kind of uh, you kind of can tell what the people are thinking of the current government, what they think of Walkai Tagadi. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. what were they saying? Oh my goodness! Uh, that's that was that was all the song about at the time we went to Asmari Beit. And uh, my father-in-law, uh, he he's never been to Gondar, and he says, "Is that the only song that they sing about? Is all kind of get it?" I say, "Yup." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, we had some of that sung at my wedding too. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a hard issue, you know. It's a very hard issue, and so. Um, the gun culture, uh, you know, a lot of people think that I'm kind of weird when I say, when I talk about Second Amendment, but it's just how you grew up, you know, at the age of seven, uh, the way you get initiated is to uh, break apart AK-47 or a pistol. In, in Ethiopia or in, in Gondar or in Georgia? In Gondar. Well, in, uh, well, I think in Georgia too. I mean, they do uh, that. I know a lot of... Uh, friends of mine who train their uh, daughters and sons in how to uh, handle a gun. Uh, th th probably not at seven, eight, seven, but mm -hmm. uh, young age. So growing up, that's what you do. At the age of seven, you're ready you know, to handle a, a weapon. Uh, and they would let you shoot. My dad used to let me shoot. Wow. So for me, gun is sort of like, you know, sort of protection. Something is something not uh, bad or taboo as uh, some people would like to view it. And so the gun culture and you know the music culture, you you kind of relate the two 
It's very, very eerily similar. Very, very similar. And hip hop, you know, hip hop and rap is back in the 70s. It used to be political, right? Tupac, and you probably know much more than I do on this. But it used to be political before uh, the 90s came and it became about, you know, the behind and. It, yeah, it's always there. I feel like there are always different strains of thought within hip hop and that exists now today. You have people who are more wanting political impact, but you also have, and, and I would say it, it kind of, divides along the line of whether they're independent or not. So I, growing up, I would go to independent music yeah. concerts, for example, because I think when they're independently minded, they're free to say whatever they want, which allows them to critique the government. But then when they get signed to a major label, you know, it's just, you know, <laughs> helping produce the vices, like yeah. you mentioned. You think that's the reason why not uh, the whole music culture kind of uh, drawn away from politics? I, I yeah what my my thing is i think from the jump you have both and even today i think you have both and from the jump you had both uh you know ultimately it's up to the individual it's like a number it's like the, there are systems but there are also individuals and i think the individual ultimately matters more than the system but the system definitely prods them in a certain direction uh handing back to you know where you were what what type of solutions were being proposed in these asmari bit or is it just solutions or is it just is it just sort of like the valor of retaking because from my understanding they basically retook humara walqait agari and alamt which were the disputed territories of the amhara region on that side on the other side i know a lot less about it but i've heard raya and azabu as as well near the wallo border with like uh, wajirat and southern tigray mm -hmm. um what, were they just valorizing the kind of the swiftness of the reclaiming of that territory in the middle of the war? Or were they saying like, oh, you're going to see like some some more stuff from us? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, even, even during TPLF in the last three decades, the people never believed in rezoning of these regions, especially Walkait and Tagere to Tigray. So it was it was sort of like when they came in, it was about democracy, it was about unity. And so not much thought was given to it by the population at a time. And but now, you know, you know, a lot of people used to, I mean, a lot of people used to speak about it, like you say, your your grandparents, you say, he wrote a letter to Melis. Yeah. Right. So um but those are like very except, ex, you know, the, the exception. Those people are the exception. But the majority of the people, you know, it went to Tigray. You know, it's the same. It's the same. That's what they used to believe. But now uh, they realize what the motive of TPLF is. You know, the whole creating this uh, grand vision of Tigray, uh, incorporating these regions and having access to uh sudan in that region and so when now the people are aware they know what the intent is they know what their big picture is and so um as far as people in gondars are concerned it's a done deal it's, it's over you know cross takaze is them and this way is us we can live in peace uh we can live in harmony but as far as uh taking this place back to uh to cry it's not it's not gonna well that brings us to the kind of current day right now ongoing negotiations are happening and we've heard that the amhara are pretty well represented at the negotiation table as well represented as as you can be given the fact that the fundamental structures of the tplf government are still in place and the systems we had before you know four different states gundar or begemdar whatever you call it Wallo, Gojam, Shoa, these are not independent states. Instead, it's one blob, the Amhara region. But I hear they're well represented at the negotiation table. And I saw some sort of globalist Frenchman today on Twitter complaining about that representation and even referring to the, the non-Amhara as Amharaized, which for me just means he's upset that there are pro-Ethiopian people at the table, people who don't want Ethiopia balkanized into a thousand tiny states that could be 
controlled by the the system of global aid that's led by America now, but could be led by another Western power down the line. And uh, I wonder what what do you think that they can negotiate? Because the worst case scenarios I hear people saying is that with pressure from the foreign policy uh, people in America, that they might try to perhaps push Ethiopia for the sake of peace, right? Putting peace as a priority to sacrifice some of that land back because they believe it was not done or to do it in a nefarious way like a referendum, you know? Because I wonder, you know, how many Amhara have been displaced? For me, it's gotta be close to 100,000, if not 200,000. And does every displaced Amhara from Walkait get to vote if there is a referendum? Like those are the, some of the things I hear is either they're gonna outright hand it back to the Tigrayan state or they're going to uh, put some sort of referendum in place and let the referendum guide what is to happen or some other compromise. I, I you know, it's very difficult to, um, to see what, you know, what would be, what would make TPLF happy? Uh, I believe that TPLF is inherently alien to peace. And what they want is to be on the top and to... Of the whole country or just the region? The whole country. And I, I don't believe they are, uh, they are content in, in Tigray. And I believe that they, ultimately, they do believe that uh, the current government will collapse, uh, will get back, and will make some changes and will we'll, um, we'll continue. And so... Uh, with that in mind, I don't, I don't, I don't see any compromising solution that uh, that they can make with the current government. Um, one thing that scares me uh, is the uh, American hand on the situation, like this French guy that you talked about, right? It's kind of interesting that to see like all these foreign guys on Twitter and social media talking about what guides. You know, I'm not even sure how many Ethiopians know about work. There are probably more in the church know about work than uh, some Ethiopians. And so uh, would there be some background deal? Possibly. But do I see it uh, bringing forth peace? I, I highly doubt it. Like, so then what, what, do you, what do you make of the negotiation? Do you think it's a farce? Like, is it just doomed to fail in your view? Or? I think so. I think it's a farce. And... Because the government wants it, uh, the the government wants to mend, uh, you know, issues with the West because it's a war torn country. They need dollars. They need money uh, to, uh, you know, to support the economy. And unless they talk about peace and negotiation, they're not going to get the money. I don't know if you've been following how many uh, how much money is flowing to Ethiopia currently. The World Bank is throwing money around. Uh, the U.S. government is throwing money around. Uh, the European Union is giving out a lot. I, of I follow the TPLF propagandist Getacho Radda, who has the lovely uh, Amharic name there, and um, I I saw him posting about the money and complaining about it because some of the money is is going to reconstruct Tigray, and he's like, why isn't it flowing through us? Yeah, yeah, it kind of makes me happy that he's complaining about it. That kind of gives me uh, comfort that there is no background shenanigans going on with TPLF, you know. But uh, so that's why the government needs to have a peace talk, at least on. Uh, uh, to continue the aid money flowing. Right, the aid money flowing. And the TPLF wants it because uh, they got their behind kicked during the last uh, episode when they came to uh, add this, close to add this anyway. I mean, they were very demoralized. Uh, last time I went to, uh, like in my trip to, to Gondor, uh, I was able to talk to the militia commanders, of whom some of them were, um, you know, close family relatives. And the figures they, t they, they told me about the, the casualties that the TPLF uh, was dealt, I mean, it was, it was, we're talking about thousands of people. They lost thousands of people. And so I think TPLF wants time just to 
settle down uh, just to reset, regroup. Um, other than that, I don't, uh, I think it's a force. I think the whole peace talk that it did is a force and I don't, I don't see anything coming out of it. Yeah, so that, that takes us to a point that you and I were discussing off camera the other day and hat tip to Curtis Yarvin, a former guest of this program, who pointed me towards the history of lustration is is the also known as the processes of demarxification and denazification now i think these are very important historic precedents to study to see what can be done uh in regards to tigray so there was a transitional government kind of set up when when Makala and all that was first toppled mm -hmm. but they found that like 80 percent of the people involved were still involved with tigray and so the way denazification and demarxification kind of happened was there were no halfway measures taken. It was everybody is retired and you actually pay them, which sounds crazy to people, but you pay them. And it happened in World War One, happened in World War II, happened with the uh, fall of the Soviet Empire as well. But you pay these people to never work again. And you totally restaff everything and you totally remake everything in your image and and in your likeness. And I think that's not what was done. What was done was kind of uh, a trimming around uh, around the hedges. Uh, I think it's important to always identify and remind people. You could go to like marxism.org or marxist.org and find like the original TPLF statements. That's because they started as a Marxist Leninist organization. I know early on too, you know, people probably thought you were crazy, but uh, you were you were calling them Nazis early on. And I think other people started picking up that language. So, uh, you know, they they weren't exactly doing the things to the gypsies and the Jews that the Nazis were, but there was this kind of race or ethnic component to what they were doing that could give homages to both the Nazis and to the to the Marxists. So I wonder if you could talk about, you know, if you think these negotiations aren't going to work, if they're going to be belligerent till the end, that means there's kind of got to be a, a military led solution and, a, a, you know, a remaking of the area. I've seen some people draw maps where they say, like, for example, totally get rid of the current system, but don't go back to the 14 states and go into like a, a north, south, east, west type deal, in which case you might have like parts of Amhara and Tigray currently uh, smashed into a new zone, like the upper zone and administrated under one regime. Is is that more of what you're thinking of or what, what type of ideas do you have about how there could be made long lasting peace with people who are perpetually belligerent and not not seeking peace yeah i think um you know that the day before i saw your tweet on uh, uh the nazification of uh you know the, the, what america did to germany mm -hmm. and to japan too by the way japan yes. does not have any military uh right now and so what I was Are you there? Yes. I, okay, you you cut you cut out a bit. Am I back now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right when you're about to drop the, back? Uh, the truth bombs. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can. Sorry. I think it's my internet. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's okay. I can hear you. Just uh, keep going. This was the best part. <laughs> I was waiting for this part. The denazification is right when it cut out. Right. Right. So, uh, so my my I was trying to figure out like what can be done ideally to fix this uh, problem, and I'm thinking like why don't we have obviously this is ideal. Uh, why don't we have a tax, a Tigray tax? Uh, the Eritreans, uh, us Ethiopians and Somalis, uh, this this money goes to Tigray. Just overflood them with money, with all infrastructure, work and everything, and just disarm them. 
Um, and then I saw your your tweet and I said, oh my goodness, that's actually that's some crazy idea that I had in my mind and it has some historical backing to it. Uh, like you said, what America did to Germany and uh, uh, Japan after World War II. So obviously that's very ideal, but I think what the current current government is doing is that. Just yeah. to well, well, what we have to pause and like reflect on this. Yeah, there were back and forths. They toppled the regime in Makala, but then now they're back, and they haven't moved kind of past the Amhara region in terms of the federal mm -hmm. troops. Right. So they would have to recommit to crossing into the Tigray region. As opposed to just kind of leaving it as the standstill, is that you know, is that something that you're talking about? Oh, you mean the the, the government, the current mm -hmm. government? Well, just just keep the status quo right now. Uh, except uh, obviously, you know that there is a huge military uh, force in Walkai Tagare region. That's why they never touched that area. By the way, uh, that's why they never even try there. Uh, you hear news here and there that they attempt, but there was no serious attempt uh, by TPLF in Walgai region. Yeah, another friend that went in January and had friends who were in the militia told me that they were sending human waves in the hundreds, unarmed people, random guy, maybe one in 10 has a grenade or a machete or something. And just, it, it's, it's sad, but yeah, it, it surprised me that they had more success kind of on that Wadlo route to Shoa to Debrasina and not so much success towards Gondor city. Well, it's just by design by the current government, they put their forces there uh, primarily. And uh, did they let them you know, walk through it on purpose? Possibly, I'm not a military uh, expert, but I can see why they would do that. Uh, but as far as, as far as what can be done, I think keep the status quo, you know, they cannot maintain they're counting trucks now, food trucks going to Makale. And you cannot administer 5 million people or so just getting uh, wheat from the West for how long? So eventually the whole, you know, the whole TPLF will collapse and uh, it will be easy for the current government to, to do what needs to be done. But um that's that's the only solution that i can think of right now that makes sense and you know in america we've seen like insurgencies like this in iraq last like sometimes you know 10 years 14 years 20 years in afghanistan like if that's the case you know it's like 10 years from now getacho just keeps getting bigger and bigger and uh <laughs> you know they're still in an insurgency i mean it would be rough for all of the innocent people all of our innocent countrymen and countrywomen who are under siege there but i guess that's the the easiest way you're saying to yeah. out, to outlast them uh yeah. in terms of disarming them yeah and another element of it is you know you, you talked about uh our population there under siege you know people in tigray they are our, our people our brethren and it's sad to see uh, the people go through this, but you know, years of brainwashing is what led them to support TPLF. Um, so ultimately, my hope is, and what the government's hope is, I believe, is the people will rise up. And I think recently uh, you might have heard there are a lot of uh, uprising in Tigray in Makale. Uh, people are just they they're just being hopeless you know they don't have anything to eat they're not doing anything they're not going to school basic government infrastructures are not working and so uh, people will uprise and uh, stand against tplf and it will soften up um, this tplf belligerent behavior and all this just combined you know uh, will ultimately will bring the downfall of tplf and yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah go ahead yeah and in another thing that that bothers me is you know what's happening in oromia region and what was happening in pockets of amara uh, all of that is the work of tplf uh, one way or another i mean you can disagree some people disagree that you know the you know this oromia 
region has its own mission and political goals and whatnot. But for me, uh, the cause is only, the source is only, only one, and that is TPLF. And so if the government can mitigate those issues, pockets of issues here and there, uh, and keep the status quo, I think the end, uh, the end will come ultimately. Yeah, I hope so. And I, I had Lich Tedla Malaku to talk about some of that issue in Oromia and other places. And ultimately, that's an issue of dismantling the system of governance that TPLF put in effect that was destabilizing people over some 30 years, telling them they're different, you know, ethnically, as if all the people of the Horn of Africa aren't mostly the same genetics and same culture and same language and same so many other things. And a genuine and general lack of law and order and rule of law that I hope will be restored soon. But yeah, you have to take care of one thing at a time. So I, I thank you for your, your firsthand accounts and your longstanding witness against uh, this criminal organization. It's designated a terrorist organization by the government of Ethiopia. And, and hopefully the negotiations work out. If they don't work out, hopefully some sort of disarming or some other genuine path towards perpetual peace is is laid down. In the end, I, I asked the Chitedla the same thing. Uh, I'll ask you, is there, from your time there or from other knowledge that you have, is there anything for our non-Ethiopian friends and family who there are a lot of them watching or Ethiopian Americans or other Ethiopians in diaspora, is there anything for them to do? Like other than, you know, telling Biden not to invade, you know, is which is a good thing. Is there is there any organization you point them to? Is there, if they say, what can we do? Or is it just, you know, stay informed and uh, tell people not to invade Ethiopia? Well, you know, social media has become uh, a war front, uh, especially in uh, in the last couple of years uh, when it comes to Ethiopia. And uh, the TPLF here in America, they have, you know, they have money, they have resources, they have personnel, and they kind of uh, muddy the water. You know, they are the ones who are doing all these atrocities, but uh, Tigray genocide become a thing, you know. And so my advice uh, to to those people, you know, non-Ethiopians, even Ethiopians, uh, to be quite frank, and some of our friends, uh, when the war broke out, they had this tendency that you know, oh, Tigray genocide, you know. And then I had to inform a lot of a lot of people, and once they understand the whole political uh environment and what is happening in the background they start to realize aha um so the tplf is the issue here and so um i don't know i i really i don't have any organization that i can i can uh you know the no more movement is something uh very active the hashtag hashtag no more uh there are a lot of resources uh, uh that they can access through that but um other than that i really don't have much that's good they can stay informed check out hashtag no more hashtag ethiopia just search ethiopia and you'll see all the dialogue all the time on twitter especially but on TikTok, ig everywhere facebook <laughs> if you want to see more of the stuff from people in ethiopia and uh find a whatsapp or a telegram channel i'm sure they're they're active there to yeah. thank you so much Diakontadiku, for sharing your experience and your thoughts with us and hopefully we'll see an end to this soon i hope so i hope so and let's all pray thank you Henry K, for inviting me back and i am uh you know i, I, I always follow this channel and thank you for uh this platform for us to talk about matters of our beloved country <laughs>